Hi, my name is Stan. My name is Connie. My name is Judy. My name is Elian. And I'm a caregiver to my mother. And I care for my mother, Octavia. And I'm a caregiver for my mother. And I'm a caregiver to my husband, Art. I'm a caregiver for my wife, Anne, who's 72 years old. Basically, I've done everything for providing for both of them. I take care of my mother on the weekends. I take her grocery shopping. Not only household chores, I provide her medical care, coordination, driving, errands. Choosing meals, making meals, cleaning up. Uh, I find that uh, I take care of anything that he can't take care of. Sometimes I find balancing time a real challenge. Uh, the difficult part for me is taking me into consideration. Balancing her needs with the needs of my family, the needs of my marriage, and my own needs. Staying calm, nice, and positive. The real challenge is, of course, the distance and the moment you get that last phone call. What I love most about taking care of her is knowing that we're providing a secure and comfortable home for her. It's the time we spend together. It's the adventure of finding out new things all the time to try to help him stay out of pain. My name is Ed. I'm a spouse and I'm a caregiver. My name is Colette. I'm a daughter and a caregiver. I'm a caregiver, and I'm a daughter. And I'm a wife and a caregiver. I'm a daughter and a caregiver. I'm a son, a nephew, and a caregiver. Hi, my name is Deborah Day, and I help manage United Way Caregivers Coalition. While caring for a loved one has its special rewards, it's a very challenging job. It can be stressful, overwhelming, and sometimes lonely. Each caregiving situation is unique, but all caregivers share the need for information and support. And that's where the Caregivers Coalition comes in. We help caregivers receive the support they need to take care of their loved ones and to take care of themselves. Caregivers who lead healthy, productive lives will be better caregivers. The most important thing to remember is that as a caregiver, you're not alone. So, my name is Stacy Joyce. I'm a professional geriatric care manager, and for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a professional who is an expert in the field of aging, and in order to be a care manager, you should be certified. I possibly there are people out there who are practicing who aren't but you should be certified and you do need to have a license of some sort which can be a um, it's usually typically either registered nurses are geriatric care managers or social workers I happen to be a registered nurse um, and caregiving 101 we're going to talk about caring for adults and that can be caring for a parent, it can be caring for a spouse, an adult child, and there are many people out there who are caring for their siblings. So that's um, the, the topic we're going to be talking about. Um, caring for an older person is a task that probably all of us are going to experience and have to do at one point or another. No one prepares us to be a caregiver. There are no classes at this point. I expect as the baby boomers age, there probably will be classes that will teach you the actual steps involved in being a caregiver, but that doesn't exist right now the way it does for people, let's say, who are going to have a baby, and there are Lamaze classes to teach you how to bathe a child, feed a child, and what to expect when you're having a child. Nobody really tells us what to expect when we are going to be caring for an aging adult. So you, most of us have to figure it out on our own. I, before I became a geriatric care manager, I was a caregiver for my father, and it was definitely a learning experience, and I had to figure it out on my own. Getting your paperwork in order. So when I enter a house to do an assessment on an older person and I meet with a family or with an individual, 
one of the very first things I talk about is paperwork, which I sort of wish I didn't start off with, but it is one of the most critical things to get in order when, either for yourself or when you're caring for somebody. And that's because I see all kinds of things happen when people don't have their paperwork in order. So one of the first things to get in order is what is called advanced directives. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because that's actually a topic of another one of these um, meetings. But I am going to just kind of touch on it. So advanced directives consist of two parts. One is called the living will, and that's a document in which you can state your wishes if you are not able to speak for yourself. So I have actually had clients who can blink their wishes to me. So it really, you, you have a lot of control over your own health care unless you absolutely can't speak, such as if you were in a coma, then these papers come into play. And in your living will, you state your wishes, such as I don't want to have CPR, that type of thing. You might talk about whether or not you want a breathing tube if you need that kind of equipment. The other part of advanced directives is a healthcare power of attorney, giving someone the power to make decisions for you on your behalf. I advise people to have conversations with anyone that they, whom they choose to be their power of attorney so that more than speaking specifically about CPR and breathing tubes and those types of things, to speak overall about what is the, who am I? Who am I? What, what would I want and what wouldn't I want? So it's important if you have somebody that you choose to be, to have that power, to be your health care power of attorney, that they have an understanding of who you are and what your wishes might be. Because they may have to make decisions without relying on paperwork. They may just have to make a sort of call on the spur of the moment based on whatever's going on with you. So you want them to understand what you might want. Um, a healthcare power of attorney, it's also called a durable power of attorney for healthcare, and there's also the term healthcare proxy. Those are all the same thing. The other important document to have in place is a financial power of attorney, a durable financial power of attorney. That document, um, the minute it's signed, it goes into play. So you want it to be someone that you trust, that you give this authority to or this power to, because if you give your financial power of attorney to a spouse or a child that might use it against you, they, they have tremendous power with that document. The reason to do it, though, is because if you ever have a situation where you are, let's say, hospitalized, and this has happened to my clients, where you can't write a check or pay a bill or to conduct your affairs because you're incapacitated, if you don't have these documents in place, you're going to end up having to go to a court to get something in place to give you that authority. And when you're dealing with a health care crisis or some type of crisis, the last thing you want to do is to have to go into court to get some kind of authority to just conduct day-to-day -day business. So I urge people to do these documents. I also tell people when you're doing, you know, I'm a mother, so I understand you want to make sure every, all your kids are happy and no one's nose is out of joint, but I really do urge people, don't choose these people based on making one of your kids feel good. Choose this person based on this is the right person for the job. If you would not be want you would not want to be kept alive with extraordinary measures, don't choose the daughter that can't quote unquote pull the plug. I mean, you want somebody who is the right person for that job. Um, an elder law attorney can help you get this paperwork in order, and you can do it on your own, but um, oftentimes people go to attorneys to do a big lot of stuff, a will, a living will, a financial power of attorney, and I recommend elder law attorneys for these jobs. I gave you in your packet a list of important papers and things to try to find um, when you're providing care for somebody. These are documents that are often needed for one reason or another in your caregiving role, 
and it is good to try to find these as early in the caregiving process as possible. Number one, sometimes it takes a while to get your hands on these, so start early. And number two, sometimes the person to whom you're providing care, as time goes on, can no longer tell you where things are. So getting these papers while the person for whom you're caring can help you find them is a good, good thing to do early. I can read the whole list if, you, if you'd like. Social security cards. Surprisingly, many people have lost their social security cards, and you may need those. Birth certificate. Children's birth certificates, marriage certificate, divorce papers. I've had to go into court to, find, to, to get the divorce papers for a client who needed those for a Medicaid application, and it's time consuming if you have to take those kinds of steps. Passport, mortgages, information about second homes. Lots of older people own multiple homes, and you want to be able to gather all of that information titles, deeds, uh, car paperwork, car registration, military papers. Again, that's one that we often are trying to find, and it can be difficult to find. Um, retirement papers, partnership agreements. This is if you had a business with someone. Here's an important one, computer passwords. I've had clients pass away, and they never told anyone their password, and now their spouse can't get onto the computer, and that can be a challenge. I actually, even in my own household, I don't know my husband's passwords to anything. So it's important with all the passwords we now have that you share those with, with um, that the person for whom you're caring gives you their passwords. People's final arrangements. Many people have written out what they want for their funeral arrangements and knowing where the, that paperwork is is important. Obviously, wills, living wills, I sort of went through that. Uh, where is there a safe deposit box? Where is the safe deposit box? Where's the key? What's the number? Savings bonds, life insurance policies, disability policies, homeowners, car insurance, um, and then the rest, is, well, credit cards, that's important, and um, financial investment information. The next thing I think is probably your starting point is what are the needs of the care recipient just take a step back look around the house what are the problems here what are the needs now hopefully in your packet I know you have this one I have it titled services needed so when I go into a house I just look at the overall picture is the person that I'm there to assess or meet with or help um, can they shop? Can they clean the house? Can they fix a meal? Can they take their medications? Can they walk across the room? Can they take a bath? Can they take a shower? So it's really getting an overall handle on what the needs of the care recipient are. What are those needs? If you can put the needs down on paper, if you can take this and sort of check off the things that your care recipient needs help with, it's a way of finding help for each one of these needs. Some of those needs you're going to fulfill yourself and take care of yourself. But if you put everything down on paper, you can also see where you might be able to get help from other people. Then I say that there are going to be professionals that you can call on for help, and you should call on for help. This is where the money part comes in. Nobody ever wants to spend money. I get that, but the reality is sometimes when you spend money to hire a professional to help you, you actually save money in the end. So a good example, elder law attorneys, again, I'm a sort of fan of elder law attorneys, but they can cost a lot of money, but they can save you a tremendous amount of money in the advice they give you about your long-term care planning. So these professionals on my list are, yes, they, they come with a cost, but at the end of the day, they may save you money just by preventing the crises and, and, and helping you along the way. So on the list, I put elder law attorneys, geriatric care managers, companies that provide metal, medical equipment or do home modifications, 
home health care agencies where you might hire a home health aide to provide some um, care with basic needs such as bathing, feeding, those types of things, a bill paying professional, and transportation service. And two I want to go back to because I, I, they definitely are money savers at the end of the day. One is companies that make home modifications. There are many simple things that you can do to make the care recipient safer at home or also sometimes if they're in a facility, there are things that, you, that can just make their lives a little easier. So for instance, a very simple and inexpensive home modification might be a grab bar that you would put in the shower or next to the toilet. That one inexpensive piece of equipment really prevents a lot of falls. And if you prevent, if someone falls and fractures a bone, well, right, you're, st you're opening up a can of worms and there's usually some kind of cost to that broken bone in dollars and cents. So the cost of a grab bar is minimal and the number of falls it prevents is huge. So that's an example of a way that, you know, yes, you're going to pay someone to do that, but at the end of the day, you'll save some money. The other one on here that, that I think is definitely money well spent, most of my clients need this type of assistance, bill paying and paperwork. And again, a family member can certainly do that job, but um, oftentimes family members are stretched thin and this can be something that's worth paying for. You, we get a tremendous amount of paperwork in all of our lives coming in and out of our house. It's overwhelming, I think everyone would agree. And when people get older and they're suffering from an illness or they have cognitive impairment or something like that and that paperwork starts coming in, mistakes happen. Always. I, I don't know that I have a client who um, is is ailing in one way or another that doesn't hasn't made a mistake on their paperwork. This is one that everybody gets and it's not even a scam. It's different insurance companies sending you paperwork that you think is from your own insurance company, but if you sign up on the, you know, sign on the dotted line, you're actually getting rid of your insurance and signing up for a new plan. That kind of paperwork comes into the homes of everyone who gets Medicare when it's the Medicare enrollment period. And many of my clients don't know that that paperwork doesn't relate to their own insurance. So having a professional on site to go through all the paperwork and tell you this you can throw out, this is important, is extremely helpful. Another thing on my Caregiving 101 list is getting a personal emergency response system. I completely dislike the commercials that they have, but they work really well. The, the, just to give you an idea of the cost of that, it is in the 40s per month. Many of these companies will give discounts for people who have low incomes and also for veterans. So, and can, I will say I've actually gotten on the phone with some of these companies and negotiated lower rates. I can't say that they would all do that, but it's certainly worth a try. The, when you have these personal emergency response systems, you can get a little bracelet and wear that one, or you can wear a necklace. And you can wear them in the shower. Many of my clients need to be reminded over and over that it can get wet because the purpose is if you fall in the shower you want to be able to press it. The, between the bracelet and the necklace I sort of urge my clients to use the necklace because if you were to have a stroke and not be able to use one arm and that's the arm where it's the opposite arm from where you have the bracelet you might not be able to press that button. So on your outline medications was number two on mine, I bumped it down because it's number two for nurses, but maybe for other people, it's further down the list. For me, why it's so high up on the list is I, I, I'm not sure I've ever walked into one house to do an assessment where the individual was not incorrectly taking their medications. I see that pretty much 100% of the time. Because if you're ill or cognitively impaired, to have to focus on getting your medications exactly right is challenging. 
I brought my handy dandy medication box. I ask all of my clients to use this kind of box. Um, but many of them will say, well, I'm only taking one thing and I'm only taking it in the morning. So I just want one morning box. But why I push people to use this one, and this is the biggest one I know of, four spaces for four different times of day and then seven days a week. And I push people to use this because as, as a person ages, they often, their, their regime changes. So maybe at age 50, you're taking one a day. But by age 90, you may be taking six or more in each of these spots. So the earlier you get used to this system, I think the better it goes. So that is why I recommend getting this one earlier rather than later. I also put on here making a list of doctors, all the doctors and the phone numbers. This can be important because when you go into an emergency room, if you need, let's say, a neurologist, if they don't know that you've already seen this neurologist, they're going to assign you one. So it's far better if you have a list of the doctors you've seen so when they're calling in different specialists, they know who you're already working with. And you can't always tell someone that when you're in the middle of an emergency. So I advise people to make a list of their doctors. Make a list of your past surgeries, your health history, put it all in writing. It will save you time when you are going from doctor to doctor. A list of your diagnoses. Important to keep a list of medical tests. We often have clients who have tests repeated that they just had because they don't realize that this CAT scan that they had in May is the same CAT scan that a different doctor's ordering in June. Keep a list of your vaccinations. Write down the vaccines you've had. There are certain ones you only need to get once after a certain age, so keep a list, and then you won't have those repeated. Um, I do, a lot of people, when they're stressed, they want to reach out and call the physician. You can always do that. Sometimes people are afraid to call a doctor after hours, but you can. I call doctors at all hours of the day and night. And when you call, have, your, have in writing what it is you would like to discuss with the doctor so that you're not complaining to the doctor about the stress of caregiving. That's not sort of the purpose of a call to a doctor. Just have a, a list so that you get right to the point and they know why you're calling. And um, so I put down some reasons to call a doctor. Might be a new and unusual symptom, not just a minor thing like my arm hurts, but something significant. My mother isn't breathing very well, or she's gasping for air, and this just came on suddenly. Or confusion that comes on suddenly would be a symptom worth noting. Sometimes that is something like a urinary tract infection that's causing that. There's a simple fix, but if something comes on suddenly, that might be worth letting a doctor know. If a medication causes side effects, that's a good reason to call the doctor or discussing test results. I tell my clients, try to avoid the emergency room because when an older person goes into the emergency room, they often come out worse than when they went in. And sometimes they come out with infections. There's certainly a lot you know, floating around hospitals. And sometimes they come out, a, a very common thing that happens when an older person goes into a setting like an emergency room or a hospital is that they can develop a temporary, it's called delirium, it's like a psychosis. It looks like dementia. I have many times family members call and say, my dad is in the hospital and he got dementia overnight. I say, well, it's not dementia. It's very common. It's a delirium. It, it really can be a little unnerving because people get a little wacky. That is a thing that can come about when you go into an emergency room or a hospital. So if you can avoid it, avoid it. And then I did list on here certain things where you should call for an ambulance. Un someone's unconscious. I think that's probably obvious, unless it's end of life and, and um, they're not going to the hospital anymore. Person having difficulty breathing, no pulse. A person's in a great deal. Someone who falls and is in a great deal of pain may need to go to the emergency room and have an x-ray. Um, someone with severe abdominal pain is definitely something that should be evaluated. Obviously, profuse bleeding, seizure, 
headache, slurred speech, any signs of a stroke like that, and then of course the um, heart attack signs, chest pain, heaviness, jaw pain, shoulder pain, those symptoms. It is important when you're a caregiver. I didn't do this well when I was a caregiver. I was caring for my father, and that was before I started my business. It's actually why I started my business. And one thing I never did well, I never thought about his perspective. I was so busy being stressed and consumed with my stress and what I was doing for him and feeling put upon, I didn't stop and think about what it must have been like for him. When you're receiving care, most of the people who receive care were independent at one point in time, caring for themselves. And they don't want to be dependent. I mean, none of us want to be dependent. So the person who's the recipient of the care, I've learned in my business, not with my father, but to really try to think about their perspective and what, how it must feel to have to be dependent on somebody else. Ways to deal with the stress of caregiving. I certainly well know that stress. I'm not so stressed now when it's my clients, that's different. But when it was my father, I was stressed a good deal of the time. Sometimes I spend as much time talking to family members, on the phone with family members, listening to family's problems as I do with the patient, I guess you'd say. And one of the things I, I know quite well, it's, it's the code by which care managers live by, but it's just sort of the basics is that the care recipient has a right to make decisions that are bad decisions. This is such a challenge for caregivers to accept. The only area where I say gets a little questionable is the decision to drive if a family member knows that that person should not be driving. That's a little bit tricky because you do have a little bit of a responsibility to the rest of the world to keep an unsafe driver off the road. But a person is allowed to make their own poor choices for themselves. I often, often have spouses and adult children on the phone saying, my mother will not listen to me. She's eating salty food. She's not supposed to be eating salty food. And the thing is, she has a right to eat salty foods. May not be in her best health interest, but she has that right. So that's a challenge I deal with, and it's something that as a caregiver you have to understand, that you may know what's best, and probably you do, but that person has a right to decide not to do what you're recommending that they do. Uh, the obvious one, take care of yourselves. It, it, it's so obvious and it's also so difficult because when you're completely stressed as a caregiver, you feel like there is absolutely not a spare second in the day to do something for yourself. But that stress just builds and builds and builds and I urge you to take some time for yourself. Get people to help just as much as you can. It will make a difference. Just an, a walk around the block, that simple thing, can do a world of good for the release of the stress that you have in caregiving. Getting help, I said it earlier, get help from friends, from professionals, from siblings, and from your adult children. And understand when, I was a sibling, so there's four others helping me to care for my dad. And we all came at my dad with different perspectives. And what's difficult is that I might think that my sister should fly to, from Chicago to see my father. But if she doesn't want to fly from Chicago to see my father, that's okay. You have to accept that what you may want to do for your parent or your spouse or your loved one might not be what the other people involved in that person's life want to do. And I say, take a step back. Things might not be perfect all the time. It doesn't go as you expect it's going to go. You don't have control over how long the caregiving is going to go on, and you really don't have control over the path. There are ups and downs, ups and downs. So I think that is about the end of my talk, other than to say one more thing, which is that try to have your goal be that you're going to 
deal with this gracefully. I didn't always do that myself, but you know, it's a goal. And at the end of the experience, and I know sometimes it feels like the role of caregiving is never going to come to an end, but I think most caregivers will say that they are better people for having cared for another person. You learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about your family, maybe you'll learn something about the care recipient, and it, it does, it does when you know as all is said and done I, I think at the end you you will have done a good thing and hopefully feel better about yourself for having done that so questions thank you <laughs>I was talking to somebody today, it was a caregiver, she's caring for her sister who, ha who is my age and has Alzheimer's, so that is a challenge. And the caregiver is, is very stressed, as you can understand she would be. And her sister right now, there were some decisions that had to be made, and the caregiver was in an kind of panicky about, am I making a decision that's going to be the absolutely wrong decision to make? And I said to her, there's really no wrong decision. There may be one decision that's slightly better, there may be one decision that's slightly worse, but there's no wrong decision. But understand that it's not, it's not gonna be perfect, and, and try, I know, I know that it's so hard, it's easy to say this, so hard to do this, but, but try to let go and just, you're making your care recipient's life better no matter, I mean, I would say anyone in this room who's here has a vested interest in, in doing a good job, you're making their life better. That's what you're doing. It's sometimes baby steps, but it's better. So the, what, she, what um, the woman in the audience said was she feels angry sometimes at the role of the caregiving, some of the things that are put on her, and I think that that is very common to feel angry, and I think that most caregivers, I think most people, but certainly most caregivers are, are dosed with a healthy amount of guilt and you feel like I should be doing more or I should be doing something better and sometimes when the needs just pile on and pile on, people get angry. They get angry at the care recipient. They get angry at the people in their world that they feel are not helping as much as they should be helping. I think what, you can't control the people that you feel should be helping as much as they should be helping. You just try to encourage them to help in any ways that you can. Don't try to own all of the burden when you can tell people, I need help in this way or that way. Try to pass along, you know, try to get some help from other people. But you can be mad about the role of caregiving. I, what I urge people to do is, I, I mean, hopefully you try not to be mad at the person for whom you're providing care, but even if you are mad at times at the person for whom you're providing care, that's okay. I mean, it's certainly not okay to, to, to harm somebody in any way, but it's okay to get angry. It's a frustrating situation. I, I mean, think about this. What parent raises children and doesn't get mad at them? Of course you get mad at them, right? You're going to get mad at times when you're providing care. You just, I think, have to try to, to understand that by being there, you're, you're doing a good job and not think that you have to be perfect at that job. And I think that's the grace I mean, is just try not to expect perfection. Understand that if a crisis comes up or if there's a bad day, that that's part of life, that's, you know, and if you can just say, okay, so today really stinks, and today's a tough one, but I'm going to get through it, that's the grace I'm talking about. Well, okay, so the question is about how to deal with people who offer advice and who play Monday morning quarterbacks when you're the one in the throes of caregiving and really 
you don't necessarily want to hear that advice. And right. And everybody does have an opinion. And the, the farther you go in your caregiving, the more you're going to hear everybody's opinion about what you should and shouldn't be doing. What I, I also hear that. I hear the reverse sometimes. I hear the family telling me what I should and shouldn't be doing with the person that I'm hired to provide assistance for. I think one strategy is understand that that is a trigger for you. Those calls where they want to Monday morning quarterback. And I would suggest get off the phone. Like, almost say to yourself, when this person calls, don't, don't get mad at them. Because when you get mad at that person, first of all, they're trying to help. Second of all, your blood pressure goes up and you feel it inside. And, and then every word that they're saying is more and more stressful. I would try just knowing that this is an issue for you. And just the minute they start with their suggestions, just say, I hear mom or my husband or the phone or whatever. I, someone's at the door, I have to go. Because now you've not given them the opportunity to tell you what you are, quote unquote, not doing right, is usually what they're trying to say. And you just don't have to listen to it. But I think you probably know who the people in your life are that give you those really helpful bits of advice and who are the people that just want to tell you you're not doing a good job. And as a caregiver, you don't have room in your stress for that. You got enough stress from other things without any room for someone telling you you're not doing a good job. So the question is, how do you deal with offering good advice to your parents and they refuse the advice and want to do things their way? And then part two of the question is how, because, and this is always the case, how do you deal with a sibling who lives far away? And I assume what you were saying was that your parents, usually the sibling who's telling the parent to do something is going to be the one the parent complains about. And the sibling who lives a 1,000 miles away is the golden child in the eyes of the parent. And that is <laughs> right. almost always. The, there's always a golden child living in California someplace. <laughs> um, two things, a couple of things. So. Many clients that I meet for the first time are resistant to my suggestions or to any suggestions. And the first thing I explain to the client I'm meeting, things such as why it makes sense to have a lifeline, a personal emergency response system. I said lifeline, that's one of the brands of many brands. Um, and why it might make sense to have grab bars going outside of the house. What I talk to people about is the best way, nobody wants to lose their independence. And the best way to stay independent is to actually take some help. That is absolutely the, the key to, the, to success in terms of staying independent. So for instance, getting a personal emergency response system enables you when you fall to, many people fall and they're not injured at all. They don't need to go to a hospital. Their biggest problem is they can't, they don't have the upper body strength to get up off the floor. Having a personal emergency response system gives you the ability to have the police come over and pick you up off the floor. Or in the case of our clients, we're on the list, so if we're nearby, we'll come over and pick the person up. They can actually say to the, um, person who's calling in to say, how are you? So the operator who gets the call calls into the house and will say, you know, Mrs. Jones, can you talk? What's going on? And sometimes the person can say, I just fell. I can't get up. So we don't need to send the whole fire department over. We can send a police car with somebody who can pick a person up off the floor. So in that case, instead of going to the hospital, which is your alternative, if you don't have this personal 
this pendant to call for help. You're probably going to the hospital. Someone's going to call 911 and you're going to the hospital. And now you've just lost a little bit of your independence. So in terms of specific items, such as railings or grab bars or the personal emergency response systems, it is the ticket to staying independent. So that is what I tell my clients who might be your parents. The other suggestion might be that, that you do have a professional get involved because it's always easier for someone to hear something from a professional than from their daughter, and I'm sure I'm going to be the same way when my kids are telling me what to do. Um, so that's a reason to hire a professional. But then part three. They have the right to refuse. I have many people who start off refusing, and eventually something happens, such as they're walking down the steps where they don't have any grab bars, somebody falls, they break a bone, and that's our, ch our chance to get the help in. So sometimes it does take a crisis for the individual to recognize that everything you've been suggesting all along was, in fact, good advice. I will say they're never going to tell you it was good advice. They're still going to say your brother in California is the only one with good advice. But we of, I often tell families we're going to wait for the crisis, and then we can put these things into place. D advice for dealing with siblings. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, I can say expect that you and your siblings are not going to see eye to eye throughout this process. But that's OK. And sometimes it's not. There, I definitely work with families where I, I have siblings who are suing each other in court over the care of the parents. Uh, so sometimes things really do break down. You have to come to terms with the fact that your brother or sister is not going to approach this problem the same way that you are. And I encourage people to do what you need to do for yourself. So in my case, I was the primary caregiver for my father. I had four siblings who were right in there with me trying to help. But I knew I was going to be the go-to person. And I couldn't, I had to say to myself, I have to do what's right for me. Just what's right for me. I can't control, I never could control my younger siblings. So I'm not going to be able to control them now. I just have to do what I need to do. Trying to get them to help and understand my point of view as often as I could. But I think when I was able to say, I'm not going to force my sister to do X, Y, and Z. I'm just going to do what. I have control over for my own life. I think you have to separate yourself from your sibling. The question is about a person with early Alzheimer's and the issue of driving. So dealing with telling him that he's not going to be driving, what, what I typically do when I have clients and driving is an issue is I get the physician to write a prescription for a driving evaluation. Has your husband had a driving evaluation? Okay, and she said her husband has not had a driving evaluation. So the, the law in the state of New Jersey is that physicians are required to report people that they think are, should not be driving. Now that doesn't happen. I don't even think most physicians know that, that, that they are required to do that. But what happens when the doctor writes a prescription, and you can get the doctor to do that. You just need to, maybe not in front of your husband, say, I want a driving evaluation. Doctors don't mind, doctors don't like to tell someone they can't drive. But doctors do not at all mind writing a prescription for a driving evaluation because it takes a little bit of the blame off of the doctor. It also takes the blame off of you. Once you have that prescription in hand, you, the, there are a couple of places in New Jersey, but the closest to Essex County would be Kessler in West Orange, and they do the driving evaluations there. Good. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great audience.